Hello, everyone, to Move for Movement. Welcome back. I'm here with Asia Upchurch. She is currently a Boston Cambridge based uh, educator, um, artist, the dance diplomat. We'll get into that. Um, all around awesome lady. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today, Asia. Thank you, Catherine. You know, I always figure if you've got something cooking, it's probably something good. So I'm excited to be invited. Thank you. Aww, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so I love that the dancing diplomat, it's, I don't want to say brand, like it's so much deeper than that. And I was reading your website. I love, um, what is it? You're a soil agitator and seed planter. So tell us more about that, please. What, what, what does that work involve? What does that look like? Right. So a few years ago, I was um, in some professional development space. Um, at this point, they all seem to run together because what is time? But I, I know that it was at least two years ago, but maybe four. Um, and in this group, we were kind of prompted to think of um, either a metaphor or an image that we thought uh, described our work. And I just really enjoyed that space to, to think about, um, you know, not caught up in a title, but what is the work? You know what I mean? What is, what is the stuff that I do and that like churns inside? And I thought that, you know, I've had um, amazing opportunities and I try to continue to create them where I get to go into different spaces and offer my perspective, my little two cents <laughs> in tandem with, with other nuggets of knowledge. And I realized that um, I, I tip my hat to folks who are day in, day out, K-12 particularly, teachers, educators, administrators. And I recognize that a lot of my work is going in and out of those spaces over mm -hmm. one-offs, um, which I have moved away from, or more like, um, multi-week, multi-month layered programming. And I have to realize that um, it's an opportunity and it's a gift to go in. And I consider that an opportunity to plant some seeds in that soil that is there, in that space, um, or, and also to, to maybe agitate and loosen up um, some things that um, maybe just need to air out to let in other perspective. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting into to planting and I repotted plants a, a few weeks ago. It was a very terrifying experience to me, but you have <laughs> to like, you have to like take them out of their nursery pot. Like I'm a novice. So why did I get big like tree like plants? I don't know. But then <laughs> you, have to, like, you have to agitate that soil. You got to break up some stuff and then get ready to repot them. And so I think about that also in my work where um, with joy, uh, with grace, with passion and compassion and fun, I know that I get to go into places to also break up some things that have been preventing growth. Um, mm. and I know that um, it's also like considering myself a seed planter and a soil agitator, then I know that I, I, I get to choose, right, if I'm being in places where I believe there are good gardeners who can continue the work. Um, mm. And so I have to understand my work in tandem with communities who under who like are inviting me in and I have to trust that they are partners. They're those gardeners who are gonna keep going after I'm gone. And so that's kind of why I describe myself and my work that way. Um, and it's not because I don't believe in staying somewhere and being planted, it's not that. It's that I think at a certain point in life, you gotta go, look, I've been on the planet for a minute. Instead of trying to push myself into a different type of hole, how can I really frame what I do in a way that embraces um, my gifting to be in and out and in between spaces without necessarily being firmly uh, planted and, and staying there? I love that image of, of agitating the soil and then planting and how both are necessary. If we think about dominant paradigms, right? Mm -hmm. Here's the packed soil. In order for things to change, and for growth to happen, some of that's got to be churned up, oh. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm telling you, I, love that image. I learned. I think I accidentally maybe didn't understand how to repot one of my plants, so it might be transitioning on to another place. However, it did have a moment of relief, I can tell, but I think I just uh, that was on this mm -hmm. last time. But again, you know, you got to sometimes 
loosening stuff up. And I will just say, lastly, when I was in that workshop, I don't know, I, I saved the image somewhere, but the woman, one of the women who was facilitating that space, she drew this image of me, of planting, of flowering. And I was just like, that is, that is it, that is it. Um, oh yeah, you know, gotta break stuff up so it's a plant sometimes. I love it. And also, you know, in Western culture, what do you do, right? These titles, like you were saying, exactly. like the titles, right? Versus being, right? Which involves action, but I, I am a soil agitator. I am a seed planter. This is mm -hmm. what I don't, what I, what I do, but also who I am in that sense of doing and being versus title. Yeah, and one <laughs> so of I think my- that's super powerful. One of my, I think I was in Guatemala and there the, the, the question is asked, um, a que, I think it's a que se, dedi, se dedica or like, to what do you dedicate yourself? Hmm. I was like that also, I think that was also in the time where I was like, I don't dedicate myself to a title. Hmm. And so hmm. to, to think about like, instead of asking people like, uh, what's your job title? Like, what do you do in this very like dismissive, just tell me your job title ex uh, exchange that like, what are you dedicating yourself to? So that also prompted mm. this shift. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I love that. I love that. Um, yeah. I was also curious reading about your bio and your website about you were in this place and I believe it was sophomore in college and you're like, I love international relations. I love dance and the arts and theater. I got to make this choice. And then you're like, no, I don't need to make this choice. I can combine my passions in the sense that they're both my part of my life and, you know, what I do in my life. Yeah. So for, I, I feel like many people at that stage of life, you know, young adulthood, and you're like, what am I going to do with my life mm -hmm. are there, right? They have, you know, two or more passions. So how might you advise people at that stage, you know, with your own experience or just sort of generally your, your perspective, how you find something like what you do as a dancing diplomat to bring sort of things that you might not think are interrelated, but they really are? Yeah. How might you guide someone like that in that so, place? You know, I'm always cautious to say like, I don't have answers. There's some things I feel like I have an answer on, but I can offer a response and I can offer... Mm -hmm. A provocation or you know um i will say my friend uh, i was stressed and my friend was like don't worry you'll do it all you'll be a dancing diplomat and in that moment i didn't i still couldn't figure it out but i just knew from a very technical standpoint that for me to have switched majors at that point because i did this thing where i was like no i'm i'm majoring in international relations i knew that coming in i declared early so i've been mm -hmm. i've been masterfully manipulating my schedule so that my gen eds are also specializing and so if I were to change to musical theater, which is what I was thinking, I would have needed some more time in school. And I don't have, I didn't have money for more time. And so she said that so certainly and like, but it just, but so certainly that I was just like, well, yeah, no, I can't change my major, um, but okay. So I figured out how to keep taking dance classes, which got me into the, community dance scene in DC where I was at the time. Um, and it all kind of eventually it came together and actually not after a lot of time, but I mm. think my what I would what I would offer folks are, are, are three things. One, um, this is the agitation part. I think it's wholly irresponsible of colleges and universities to ask 18 year olds to declare what they want to do. Like I agree. <laughs> them have barely scraped the age to vote you know their their legality as an adult is like very technical Just there yeah. and it's a lot of pressure and I have some people, yep. young people in my life who are feeling the that pressure and it really makes me so sad to see them like flustered and trying to mm. figure it all out so one I think um I offer that for folks to go if you're feeling a little con like just overwhelmed. It's not you. That is the design that also needs to be interrogated. So one. Yeah. Second with that is I think, um, and I say this, I teach graduate students now, and I and I really have this perspective after being in school as a student for a lot and now as a as a as a lecturer, 
you know, college really um, is a group project and it's mm. preparation for more group projects because mostly in life, you're going to have to be working with people. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're going to have to work with people and people come from lots of different lanes. So um, understand that the, the, the curriculum of college is not just about the classes that you take. Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. about how are you able to work with people? I know this sounds trite and like some after school special that you've heard before, but like for, uh, <laughs> for real, the learning yeah. is how do you talk with people? How do you learn how to talk with people? How do you learn about your own communication and how do you deal with like tasks on a timeline. Um, so it's a group project. And I think it's the most realistic thing. All those group projects are the most realistic thing the college can prepare you for. And I, this is again, coming from someone who did a lot of school. So be, leave yourself open to making relationships with people in classes and professors, because that's gonna help. The last thing I will say is, I think that um, tragically, coincidentally, what COVID and what I like to call COVID ed has revealed um, is something that I think has been happening for a while. And like really most, unless you are really, really specializing, mostly everything is super transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. So why it was very confusing for me at the age of um, 18 to go, how could this love for like international relations and youth advocacy and the arts live together? I think more and more schools, more and more departments are developing very intentional um, interdisciplinary programs and mm -hmm. or, um, students are starting to realize they can make what, they, what matters to them work. Um, mm -hmm. And so I would say for folks to realize that there is a shift happening. Like the truth mm -hmm. is, unless you know, like my oldest sister is the only human I know who knew from childhood that she wanted to be a doctor and is a doctor and didn't deviate. I wanted to be 50 million things. Um, and that's, that's real. And I think unless you know with such certainty that you are one of these very specialist type of people and even then, right? Embrace the, the, the truth of the world, which is it's a group, it's a multidisciplinary group project at all times. <laughs> so take the arts classes, take classes that you didn't think, like the, if there is an amazing professor coming for one semester to your university who you'd love to glean from them, do that. It's not gonna bite you in the butt. What will mm. bite you in the butt is if you showed, if you shudder away all the actual real learning because you're so scared about declaring a major. Mm. I already at a place of reckoning, I think, in the era of COVID mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think in a lot of ways for folks who feel like traditional major declaration didn't fit for them, this I think there's something happening here that's going to embrace that. I love that. And that resonates with me. I know I had to take a certain number of science credits. I was at George Washington University in DC and I ended up taking astronomy. And then I loved it enough to take it for the second, like it took two semesters. And I was so inspired by at least the aesthetics of it and just the energy enough to my senior choreography project was about outer space, essentially, uh, just these grand, like massive, like black holes and galaxies and all these, like, because I was just so, so I found inspiration in something that like dance and astronomy, you don't like, but I found that connection exactly. that inspired me. So I love that. It's there. Yeah. I, mean, I also I can say and I've met folks who are doing this type of programming now particularly like dance and physics and dance and stem mm -hmm. is like, I think I would have just loved and embraced physics more mm -hmm. if it had duh been taught with movement mm -hmm. like yeah, yeah let's figure out how roller coasters work but we are these like machines every day mm -hmm. all day you know and I'm just like yo I would have that would have like did something else. And so now like through art, I can like explore that. But again, these things are not disparate at all. I think yeah. these old norms of what schooling has to look like in this pigeonholing of people is being eroded. And I'm here for that agitation all, all day. So yeah, I love that. I love that. <laughs> Amazing, yeah. Can you talk to a bit about the work of agitating the soil and planting seeds 
with dance diplomacy specifically, to me, it's this using dance as this universal language to bring understanding between different groups of people who might not think they have a connection, right? But we're all human, we're all in the human race. We all breathe and bleed red. Is that, I'm wondering how you see the work. Does that resonate with you? I wonder if you could go a bit into that. Sure, yeah, I mean, at the, uh, so the long and the short of it is like, yeah, that's resonance and that's, um, I think the thing, I think um, what dance does in a way, but I think also music, I think music and dance are so, they're almost conjoined twins, um, mm -hmm. is that they create contact zones. And I'm blanking on the scholar that came up with this language. I wanna make sure I'm, I'm citing, um, but, you, absent of contact zones with actual humans, not the theory of them, not what you read in a book or online, mm -hmm. you can miss opportunities to actually understand what is universal about humanity and, hum and humans, and then how to see, appreciate, um, and not, and I say diversity in like a really meaningful way and not like some performative checklist diversity, but like right. you can really right. see diversity, you can realize some things that maybe were planted in your nursery pot that needs to be broken up and let go when you have yeah. these contact zones with people. And when you have folks who are skillful in leveraging those spaces. So, um, you know, I've written about like how hip hop dance, I will say, hip hop music, hip hop culture um, is so, uh, has such massive appeal around the globe. Um, so quite literally, you can put on a concert in country X that is a hip hop concert and you'll get people from every part, every nook and cranny of that country, neighboring countries, wherever to come out. And that's cool. They're in the space and maybe some things happen because of who's next to you. But then I go, when I'm in these spaces, particularly the opportunities that I've had through the State Department um, as a cultural envoy is... Um, I'm also trying to learn, you know, I'm going, mm -hmm. hey, we're all in this space. We could mm -hmm. also leave just taking a dance class and leave and there'd be no deeper interaction. So what's the way to be intentional around a, a crafting a way for us to see each other, for us to talk about issues that plague humanity writ large from our different perspectives. So for instance, I was invited to go to Guatemala to work with different organizations and young people around um, misogyny and sexism. And so um, I'm very aware that in the US, I, I am a black woman and all that is read, that that is read as. Um, I also know that when I travel abroad, I am American first to a lot of people and then mm -hmm. I'm black mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm a woman. And that is, a, that is a, def uh, a different type of read. So when I'm going abroad, I'm also in a place where I've done some interrogation and some reflection where I am trying to subvert any of that U.S. exceptionalism and I came in from the U.S. and I'm gonna wag my finger and I'm gonna tell y'all about misogyny. Because the U.S. Mm -hmm. got it out, <laughs> you know, is sexism and misogyny is something that is a, a global topic. And so in that space, we were able to have a beautiful conversation around what that's looked like in the like very benign pedestrian experiences of folks in, uh, in, in Guatemala and folks in the U.S. from our experiences and what that means as the world and how does hip hop um, either open up avenues for exposing that, um, flipping it, where are places where it's not addressed it. Um, and so I say it would have been one thing, not, 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 not saying that I know anybody who's done this, but I, I feel like I know there's one thing to just show up somewhere, do a cool thing and leave. Mm. I don't think, and I talk about this, I don't think fun and consciousness are mutually exclusive. And so I have been, um, talking about this conscious fun framework. Like we can have fun, mm -hmm. but we can also like do some, a little bit of agitation and, and they don't have to live opposite of each other because I love hu humanity and I love hip hop culture. I don't wanna do it a disservice. And I also don't want to pigeonhole myself as some trope of some like American showing up and telling people what to do. Um, mm. And so all of that for me is the nooks and the crannies of, of what is diplomacy. And while that, 
that 17 year old me who was going to college and like, I'm gonna be the US um, ambassador to the UN. And I was thinking about diplomacy <laughs> from a state level, right? Like that was like my legit, I was like, I'm going to American University, this is what I'm gonna do. And then it shifted. Cause I was like, uh, old people kind of suck sometimes because they're setting their ways. Like where do young people <laughs> be fresh? You know, maybe, you know, so I think diplomacy doesn't have to mean these protocols that people at the state level, heads of state level are, are, are going through. And then that's what the rest of the world lives by. I'm going like, diplomacy is like, how do you listen? How do you unpack yourself? How do you create those contact zones? How can we have fun and learn with each other, see more deeply, um, into each other and ourselves. Um, and the arts are an amazing tool to facilitate that. And so that for me is what is happening when I call myself the dancing diplomat, that, that type of soil agitation, seed planting, deeper communicating nuances, that's the diplomacy. The dancing is the vehicle, right? It's Cause that's like such a primary language to me. So mm. yeah. That's, that's what that means for me. And perhaps just as much as being there to teach oh. in a way that's, to, you know, for lack of a better word of like, this is the dance teacher, the person leading workshop or, you know, what's, what's ever happening, but that person is receiving and it's this conversation and that being as a form of soil agitation because that's not what the paradigm is right right exactly, exactly. yeah i mean i've learned some beautiful things i met some amazing people i first went to honduras in 2008 i was actually there at like this election party with all these like foreign officials when obama was elected here um and then january of this year i went back for i think the fourth time because of those friendships, hmm. those relationships stayed open. I've grown, the, the friends that I've made, the organizations I, I befriended have grown, but we understand how working together, right? There's, there's this need where I can be not some superwoman with a cape, but I'm coming in to support some other things and, and being received because of my, out, my welcomed outsiderness to a conversation that's happening there. So, um, you know, it's not this, you know, plop and drop. <laughs> it's not helicopter in and out. You know, I, I look for those ways to sustain relationship. It's wonderful. I love it. I'm also curious, I first met you in DC, which you, you mentioned you danced there. Uh, I took your class set, um, Joy of Motion, feels like forever ago. I know. Um, and then later kind of reconnected in Boston when I was there. I was there for many years. You're still there. Um, and you're like, don't really teach a weekly class anymore. Like I've done that life. Um, so I feel like a lot of people are in that space where it's like, I'm a dance artist and, and I teach like 15 classes a week just to pay the bills. And it's this yeah. form of a rat race that can really lead to burnout. And I feel like you, were able to find another avenue for yourself like it just I don't know if it was a perspective shift or something else where you could make a life work in in education and in the arts and creativity um so for people mm -hmm. stuck in that that rot for you know lack of a better word just like how do I get out of this because I'm burnt out and I love how you said you know I don't have the answers but I can offer a perspective I can offer an observation yeah. um yeah, how, how would you advise those people about sort of finding another route for themselves? Yeah, I mean, listen, like you said, you can make money well and choose. I feel like BC before COVID, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I did the thing where I was teaching at one point, like somewhere between 12 and 15 classes a week. And also trying to, I was also at that time trying to like establish my artistic creative voice with a, with a new company. And first I realized that there is diminishing returns to gain. So like you can make all this money teaching all those classes, but for me, it was depleting how available I was 
to my artistic creative voice and space. Um, and you know what I what I have to say is like there's there there is no universal response to this. It's a couple of things in the matrix. Like one, you have to be honest around uh, your finances, and not just right now, but also um, zooming ahead a little bit, right? Like what where do you want to be? Is teaching these mini classes a means to an end so that you can define it as like I can do this for a year, or the other thing is to ask yourself what's the flow that you want to be in? There are some folks who I marvel at, like I thought for many years of like teaching the weekly class at the community studio, like I was happy, it was great. And then I realized it was, um, I, had, I had more of a curiosity around developing curriculum with people who would definitely be there week in and week out. Mm. And so I had to recognize I'm not mad at the studio. I'm not mad at students because there's ebbs and flows when your class is like super, super, super full and not. And then there's more classes popping up other places. I was like, it's not that. Yeah. I had to realize that I needed a different space because what I was trying to do was going more towards this, um, a, a deeper educational space about the craft that I couldn't quite mm -hmm. do in a weekly class at a studio. And so, you know, Listen, the dance world is also like three degrees at most of separation. So <laughs> somebody invites you in to be a guest. They know that, that you, you know, I, I, I pride myself not on a lot of things, but I pride myself on like finishing well. My mama says that. And so I don't have bridges that I've burned and it's not because I'm a people pleaser, but I also realize this community is small. And so if I want, you need your work to be able to stand on itself as well as like people like hype you up. And so I knew somebody um, invited me in and I had a conversation about them with like, yeah, I'm a little bit more curious about the, about the, 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 the college, the, the higher ed space that I knew that they could also see this work. They knew that I could learn like how to, how to shift to that system. And so for me, what I, that was my path, realizing something was shifting in my goals as a dance teacher that weren't fitting that particular environment works for mm. lots of people, it wasn't working for me. And so um, that for me is like, I've always had education was my second master's degree at one point. I was doing a dual master's, but I didn't like the way that program was designed. But I'd always been in education through an AmeriCorps program, through tutoring, through you know community outreach. Reach. And so I, without studying how to make a curriculum, I was getting those skills and I could ask people. And so when the opportunities opened up for me to be like, hey, higher ed, would you teach this class? Would you teach this class? You know, be adjunct. I was like, this actually feels like the better sandbox for me. And so mm -hmm. folks have to ask themselves and you have to keep asking yourself because you're going to grow. Who I was at 21, thank God, is not who I am at 40. 21 did great things, but that mindset was not going to help me progress. And so I think if folks are not being honest with like, what do you, what financially, what decisions can you make? Because if you need to do that grind, you need to do that grind. But also you have to define, put a timeline on that because it will suck your soul. If you're like, I'm also trying to create, creating and teaching 50 classes a week, they're going to bump heads. I don't know one dance teacher that can't tell me differently, right? Mm -hmm. You realize your goal is more leadership than make some connections with people in leadership at dance schools or in dance departments or dance programs and make that pathway. If you're, if you're thinking, maybe I do want to hire a space where I have the same students for 13 weeks because I want to really monitor and support that type of growth, make those mm. But You've got to be able to define for self, what is it that I want to do? Where do I think I want to go? Um, so I think if I hadn't been able to be honest with myself that I was outgrowing that space, I would have eroded my creative process more. I would have been very psychologically just unhealthy and unfun to be around. Um, but I also wanna say that I understand that everyone can't, I don't wanna romanticize the decision. You, right. you gotta put a pen to paper, line up some decimal points and you gotta talk to people. Um, Unless, you know, I didn't, I'm not a trust fund baby. So that's why I had to be. <laughs> but if you've got, if you don't have as much of a financial weight on your shoulder, then there's a whole other pathway. So again, all I can offer is my perspective and observations. So hope, hope that that is mildly helpful to someone. 
Yeah, I, I that introspection, I love that. And I think it's so key because you can just keep going in the cycle and the cycle. And if you don't stop to look at what is and what you really want, what's inside of you, then yeah, you get stuck and one day you realize like, I don't feel good. And you start my teaching and my craft. Else. And everything else, and it's like, uh, it might be you. <laughs> I just, you know what I want to say, Catherine? I want to make help make introspection and reflection sexy. If you are an artist, reflecting is part of the job. Mm -hmm. If you are an educator, reflecting is part of the job. So don't try to mm -hmm. microwave that, like. It's sexy because it'll help you get where you need to be. But if you're just like, ah, something else wrong, man, 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 then you go, then you will be in that rut. And that's just right. not how you live. Right. I love it. I love it. Yeah. And that leads, I think, nicely into um, you also, like you said, you're a lecturer at Harvard. Um, and you're in this higher education space. You talked about being with these same students and for 13 weeks and really nurturing their growth. Um, so I'm wondering about creative practice and higher education. Like obviously there's dance degrees and dance classes, right. but um, how that relates to like an actual like creative life in the real mm -hmm. world and how those intersect for you. And if there are challenges, like you spoke about, you know, that weekly class life, teaching 15 classes and trying to create also and how that's challenging. Um, I'm wondering about how that balances for you now, like how that might differ. Or, yeah, I'm wondering how you could speak to that. Yeah, I mean, the other thing is, you know, I like the academic calendar. Um, <laughs> I've been able to um, really take advantage of the summer, quote unquote, off, which is not like a beach, three month beach vacation. One, I can't afford that. <laughs> So I think that that just, I mean, it seems super romantic, but at the end of the day, like after six days, I'm like, okay, so then what happens? But I say that about the academic calendar for me and why I think about that in my process. What I do in the classroom, what I do in the stage, in the studio for me are just different earrings on the same face, right? Like but, <laughs> it's just different accessories. But it's the same face, it's the same head. And so um, I my, my, my practice as a, as a, as a lecturer um, really informs my creative practice because those things that I'm learning as well from students and from the design of the learning environment give me fodder for like, you know, how does this intersect with questions I have been asking myself? Or like, there's so much social commentary in my classes anyway. And a lot of my work like picks up on social commentary topics. And, and so for me, they, they are research processes for the other. So the, 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 the um, professor classroom is like some type of research practice that informs Asia on the stage. Asia mm. on the stage informs that. And like, cause I'm all, I'm trying to think how does an audience, how can an audience in a classroom actually be the same type of environment? Like, you know, so that to me, um, they, they work in tandem. And then with the summer off from teaching, I've been able to, um, also lean into professional development spaces, leading workshops for uh, or artists, organizations, educator organizations um, around the things that I've been agitating soil around and the different experiences. And also I've had experience uh, opportunities to teach at a performing arts school for 10 summers um, where then I got to meet other people and you know network without like networking um, but also learn from other professionals and that feeds like learning from people who I'm like yo how did you conceive of designing a set like this to me I'm going how can I I don't want to become a set designer but I want to I'm looking at this process and I'm going yo there's something in there that I feel like could sharpen me like that intentionality like I worked with this one director and I joke with him all the time He's so passionate about the final product that he wants to push people to, not because he's looking at pain, but because he sees that that is the thing that's just going to be so beautiful for the whole production. And I joke with him because he gave a cast of 50 folks four counts to come from their offstage positions to hit their onstage pose while singing this note. And I went, he's like, he turned to me like he kept like, do it again. You should have been there. 
And I was like, and the I said, you gave them four accounts. I was like, yeah, but I need to see if it will work. <laughs> and like, that, like, I know I might be asking for something a little crazy, but just like go with it. And so I'm like, he's so, his, his standard of excellence and, and for pushing people, I was like, yo, I can be a better educator. And so all of that to say, Higher ed for me, really, uh, the, what, what works for me, Asia, is that for a, a term, I have the same amount of students. We get to build a community together. There's all this multi-directional cipher style learning from and with each other, which I love. And there's ways that I can really facilitate. I think of myself less and less of a teacher and more of a facilitator or a DJ. Like, I've had some experiences. I've been crafting my, my facilitation skills to, to help the learning and to cultivate a space that people feel okay. So I love that. I love that. And sometimes that process also gives me some space. Like if my students are chewing on a question, I'm chewing on it too. And I'm like, you know, let me journal on this. Now let me go into the studio and kick it around. And like, so they feed each other. Um, higher ed is not a perfect place, right? And that's not for everybody. So let's just be clear about that. I also don't have any delusions that the academia is like the God. Um, academia has still largely from, in, in the Western construct I can speak to, been, been conceived and, and implemented out of systems of oppression and systems of marginalization. And there's push you know, you can't find a college right now that doesn't have some type of diversity, equity, inclusion department and initiative. So there's a push happening to go like, hey, when we designed these spaces, we weren't actually thinking about everybody. And we weren't thinking about any other paradigm besides the like white hetero patriarchal one. And I'm like, okay, I'm none of those things. Um, yet here I am in this space and I'm gonna create some elbow room to push on some things to change the space that I'm in. But I don't hold academia under the gun to like in a in a in the flip of a switch be perfect. It is a huge old dinosaur that cannot make does not know how to make hairpin turns. I have no delusions about that. I'm not excusing academia for the things that it doesn't do right, but I also do not believe that I should, I am not in a position, again, I can only speak from my eye, to try to hold academia like the whole network of institutions to like, by tomorrow, y'all need to right all of these wrongs. What I can say is in my classes, in my lane as a lecturer, as an advisor, as somebody with a little bit of leverage, I am trying to create greater access. I am trying to help redefine some norms. I am trying to plant some seeds. I am agitating some soil. I am showing that we can have conscious fun. That joy does not have to, joy is not anti-rigorous. The arts are not anti-intellectual. And so while I'm in the space of academia, I leverage the fact that y'all gonna pay me to be here for a time. <laughs> so I can, I can, I got room to push. Um, mm -hmm. That doesn't work for everybody, but that again, I am defining, I don't want anybody else's relationship with higher, higher ed. I only want mine and I know what, it, what I'm trying to do. So mm -hmm. people gotta really show up for the sexy reflection and sexy interrogation work um, and introspection work because it will really benefit you. And I feel like the things that I've been able to do, especially over the last five, six years, it's because I spent some time going, actually, I will go back to school or mm. actually I'm going to temporarily move away from having a company. And now I understand how to create work for me as a soloist, or I want to learn how to be a better collaborator. Collaborator. I want to learn how to create community events. And so my intentionality, you got to be intentional with what you want, nobody else. Mm. I love that. You know, if you want to make change, you know, or if you're displeased with an institution like to this network of higher education you could sit there and be like you know that's that's a dinosaur it's you know racist patriarchal all this which it is <laughs> or you can get in there and you can make the change that you can right right and it i i, I do. yeah i think that's a much more productive perspective 
Um, you know, I, I've had my goals with higher education. Like I said, I got my master's and I'm like, I'm good. I'm done. I don't feel like that's a space that's always welcoming to me. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, maybe that could change for me. Um, and that, I think that's a really smart great thing. way. Of- you, you went for me. I yeah. got people who are like amazing and they don't mess with the higher ed space. But they're creating outside of it. And I'm like, cool. So I'm here to, I also think one of the things we have to do when thinking about, you know, movements is acknowledging that there are like all puns intended. There's different moves to the movement. There's different ways it's gonna look, right? Like we are all not gonna do the same two-step in the same space, but I'm trusting that my folks who are outside the academy are getting it. And the folks who are inside and understand that we are agents inside we are getting it folks who just want to be like taking up complacency taking up space with complacency they're they're actually not who i stand shoulder to shoulder with Um, i understand with that type of complaining or like the inability to go you know what this environment isn't for me let me remove myself but i hate this environment and you keep showing up for it like (laughs) come on (laughs) So anyway, I, was, I appreciate this. I hope people hear that, like, from, from your story, though, like, is it can't be prescribed. There is no way. That's why I think I'm careful with like, the things I do have an answer about. I'll be very clear, but I, can, I will not prescribe my experience to be the one for everyone else. What do I think are absolutes? Racism is wrong. Sexism is, is wrong. Ableism is wrong. On down the line. That's not up for debate. That's an answer. how do you respond if we think about respond as a verb um as a process like the way respond right so yeah react versus respond Mm -hmm. and that like gut like i'm gonna completely pull away and not be an agent of some kind of positive change because my like distaste or my hate for what that is that's a reaction versus a response is like what am i gonna do to make it better but, I, but it's important though. If a space is not right, like again, I could have been mad and cussed the studio out. I realized I was outgrowing the space. And me, mm-hmm. a couple little things that I tried to advocate for, I realized my well being and the impact I could have will be limited here. It's not mm-hmm. that here is bad. I need to be able to do more. So it made more sense for me to do more outside of that space. Not ragging on it, just it wasn't fit for me. So I think I just, I think that just to like put some nuances into the reaction and response is like a reaction is like, oh, you make me sick. Oh, ain't nothing gonna work here. Cool. That's fleeting. That's an emotional fleeting re- reaction. Now, and then will you stay and work or will you leave and, and keep doing? What are you dedicating yourself to? Again, coming back, it's all full circle to what are you dedicating yourself? I'm not yeah. dedicating myself to trying to fix places that will not move. Mm-hmm. I'm going to dedicate myself to work of liberation and joy, of uh, fostering cur- curiosity, of helping people feel more present and liberated in their beautiful bodies and movement. I'm not here to like make, like even at Harvard, I'm not at Harvard to make Harvard change. Harvard started in 1636. (laughs) Harvard got years on me. I'm not gonna, I'm not here to change all of that. Yeah. Take my, I take my lane, know that I'm working with other people. You know, so I, you know, we just, the, the, the movement, I don't think is singular in, in how mm-hmm. um, and the different approaches that we can have to really shifting things. And so, you know, folks, again, that's, but you got to show up for your own sexy reflection work, make it sexy, put some I sexy it. In your and get reflecting. <laughs> yeah. The, the sexy reflection interrogation. That's part of the response. I think that you're talking about yeah. and that's key. awful circle. <laughs> I'm gonna love it. I know we're way over time. I get so passionate. No worries. I could talk to you forever. Uh, what do you have coming up um, that audience members can support, 
Yeah, so look for, um, get excited about. So I three years ago at the Harvard Graduate School of Education launched Hip Hop X, which is a, a an initiative and a project to design uh, programming that is educational, um, that provides experiences to explore and experience hip hop um, culture, arts and education. And so once a month, every third week of the month, we put on a week long uh, conversation series. So it's happening actually now this week, November 16th through 20th. Uh, we are in the middle of Hip Hop History Month, um, but we're taking our week to focus on women and femmes in hip hop, so Hip Hop History Week. Uh, and so if folks want to go check out Hip Hop X on Instagram or me on Instagram, you'll see the information there. Um, but 7 to 8.15, it'll be a live webinar, but we also record and post on website and um, our Facebook pages. So Hip Hop X Lab, um, Hip Hop Herstory, a lot of incredible women um, folks in hip hop this week. So that's what's happening most immediately. And again, that's every third week of the month. Um, and then, you know, I'm still figuring out how to be this like artist who does things on the virtual, virtual streets, but, um, I just dance in my living room every morning in the meantime. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so, so much for joining us. That so much to chew on. I, and we'll put all those handles and such. People can stay tuned with what you do because it's all amazing stuff. Um, if there's anything else you want to share, please go ahead. No, I'm good. I just want to say thank you again. I hope everybody every day just move for yourself, drink water. And when you need to unplug, unplug. I love it. Introspection. 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 Sexy. Sexy. <laughs> I love it. All right. Thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Please remember to like, subscribe, throw us a comment, throw us an email, and have a great day. Introspect to the sexy. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>